Hi everyone. All right. Uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Asta Singhal, and I'm here with my colleague uh, Patrick Thomas, and we both work on the application security team at Netflix. And today we're here to talk to you about enabling product security with culture and cloud. So basically, we're here to make a case for the fact that having an enabling security culture is not just doable, but it's almost necessary to enable um, uh, fast-moving engineering teams in how we uh, put out code. So let's get started. Um, so a few months ago, I read the book The Phoenix Project on a friend's recommendation. Um, I thought it was a great book. It was uh, definitely a very engaging way to tell a really important story about DevOps and IT. But then I got to this part in the book. And as a security person, that sting a lot. You know, not getting invited to meetings, being called shrill and annoying. Just be honest with me for a second. How many of you have had this happen, show of hands, in one form of an or another at your organization? OK, so I'm not the only one. That's, that's actually good. Um, so why is that? A lot of times, people say that it's because security is hard. What makes security hard? Is it because it is a hard technical domain? Is it because it's constantly changing? There's always a new vulnerability that you have to patch or defend against? Or is it because you can't hire enough security people so you don't have enough people with the domain expertise? I think all of those are important problems that make security hard. But the one that we really want to talk about today is the problem of this adversarial relationship between security and developers. So this slide right here is from a presentation one of our security leaders did uh, a while ago at reInvent. And it kind of talks about how the fundamental objective of a developer and a security person is just at, at odds, right? A developer wants to move fast and break things and you know, build cool products. And perfect security is when nothing bad happens. So at the core of it, what each of you are trying to do is just absolutely different, right? And there should be a healthy tension because of that reason, but the problem becomes when that tension's not healthy anymore and it becomes an adversarial relationship. So as security engineers, what we should be striving for is trying to get to that common yes while fulfilling both of those things. So, I know that we are not known for this as a community, but I would like for you guys to be optimistic with me for the next 40 minutes. Um, and let's think about what would it look like if the security team just never prevented you from doing anything. I know a lot of you are like, there's no way that could work. That would be absolute anarchy. No one would listen to anything and you know, we would just not know what's going on. And that just sounds crazy. I understand those are all reasonable objections, and we'll talk about them later. But again, let's go back to the optimism, and let's assume what would it look like if we could do that, if we could operate in a way that security never had to say no to anyone. What would that look like? Now, a team does not need security's approval to go do cool things, right? They're going to solve for the business use case, and they're going to build things that need to be built for the company uh, to build the right products for the customers. So I'm sure the developers would be happy about that, right? This one is going to scare a few of you, because obviously, you know, as a security person, we're just you know, trained to be scared of this won't fix, right? But developers could decide to not fix things. But what that would mean is, at that point, they would fix things that is the right thing from a business impact standpoint, as opposed to arbitrary severity rules about the vulnerabilities. So the developers would like that because then, you know, they're making the right decision for the business. And the security people would like that too, because at the end of the day, our job is to reduce risk for the business. 
And this one, I think the security people will like because nobody likes to be the bad guy, let's be honest. So if, you know, because of the security team is not the answer to why someone couldn't do something, it would just be easier for us to work with the developers that we're working with, right? So this would probably be overall good. And this one I personally know that I would like a lot is because people wouldn't hide from me anymore. They would just come work with me and ask me questions when they need my help. Wouldn't that be great? That we would just be able to collaborate and you know, we would know about what's going on. And this one, I think you know, there is sort of a mixed feeling in security about this because I think for the longest time, we've always been like, oh, security is really special. What we do is a niche. No one else does that. But if security work isn't special anymore, the developers will just plan for that like they do for everything else that they do. So the way they make their code performant and reliable, they will make their code secure also. So our uh, goal of building secure products is still getting achieved. So that sounds good. And now that as the security person, you're not concentrating on signing off on things and like finding everything that got released and like who came and talked to you and who didn't. Now that you're not spending time on that stuff, you can demonstrate value in a different way by concentrating on things like, you know, how do we eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities or how do we build secure by default frameworks? Um, so would that be easier, this whole new model of never saying no? I think it would be easier, right? Because we would have an easier time working with engineering and we would all get along. It would sure be nicer. But really, the real question is, would it be better? Would it be more effective? Because that's what it is really about at the end of the day, right? So this is something that we do believe is the case. And this is how we do security at Netflix. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit. But before that, I need to tell you about a couple of things about Netflix culture. Because uh, some of you may have heard, uh, so Netflix has a pretty unique culture. And you know, I can't talk to you about all of it because that's a whole presentation in itself. And I don't have the time for that right now. But I will talk to you about the two core concepts that make it, one, really uh, important for us to do the way we do security because the culture enables us to do security the way we do, and it also requires us to do security the way we do. So the first one of those things is freedom and responsibility. Now, what that means is, as a developer, I have the freedom to go build whatever service or you know, whatever code I need to, to do my job, as long as I understand that it's my responsibility to do the right thing for Netflix. And in theory, that sounds great, right? Like that would drive accountability, um, and that would drive the fact that you know developers are now responsible for building secure services. And the interesting thing at Netflix is that's actually how we see things happen in practice too. Um, the other one is context, not control. So as employees of Netflix, be it engineering managers, be it leaders, be it ICs. Uh, our job is to provide all of the context to our colleagues of what they need to do, of what they need to know to make a certain decision. But we don't control that decision for them. They actually are the ones who will take that context and you know, use that to make the right decision for Netflix. Now, there is a little bit of an asterisk on that. Um, and I'd like to call it saving no for a rainy day. So you know, if there will be a situation where it's like, there is no way I can let someone accept this risk, we would use that, a that asterisk to say like, no, I can't let you uh, do that because context not control, but this is, a, you know, this is an exception to that. And the good thing about that is because we as the security team don't do that all the time, when we do, developers understand. They understand that if you're actually you know, going out of your way and saying no, it's actually probably for a reason. So, okay, so those two cultural aspects uh, are the two important things that drive how we do security at Netflix. And we came up with this concept of guardrails, not gates. So what that means is we're not going to, you know, put up a gate for you to have to, like, go around us. But what we'll do is we'll put guardrails in place so that it's easy for you to do the secure thing. 
And that's what drives a lot of the work that we do in security at Netflix. And the other thing, what that leads to is now that security is not special, we sit within the infrastructure organization and we work just like all other central teams do. So we collaborate with all our engineers, we collaborate with other central teams, and everyone is aligned in terms of, you know, what are the goals for security and what are we trying to achieve? Well, but again, to that important question, does it work? Because if, do if it doesn't, then what's the point of all of this, right? So I want to share uh, some data with you to uh, you know, demonstrate the fact why we think it works. So when we have a new developer join the company and where they're doing uh, boot camp, they are able to deploy a new externally facing service safely, meaning something that would not give a security engineer a heart attack. Uh, in the first 90 minutes of like going through that class. So what that means is we have put in place the building blocks from a security standpoint that they need to be able to safely deploy a service as soon as they start working at Netflix. Um, this is what the current developer to AppSec ratio looks like uh, at Netflix. And this really speaks to the fact that, you know, we really try to scale our function by um, automation and by finding opportunities of, you know, how can we scale the people as opposed to hiring a gigantic team? Because as you all know, security people are super easy to hire and they're very cheap. Um, and this one is kind of an interesting one. So Netflix has been running a private bug bounty program for a while now. And when we at first were like, okay, we want to run a private program, uh, bug bounty platform, please tell us how much money you think we'll end up spending. We actually, in the first year, ended up spending only one third of that projected number. And to us, what that means is in terms of prioritizing our security efforts, it sounds like we're doing that well and we're actually reducing risk in our external facing uh, attack surface to be able to uh, you know, reduce the overall risk for the company. Um, and this is a number that we try to drive up quite a lot uh, in you know, all of the work that our team does every day. Today, 36% of all vulnerabilities that we find are found via automation uh, that uh, you know, the cloud security team does. So hopefully by this point, I have convinced you that it seems like a good place for us to try to get to. All right, now I get to finish convincing you, hopefully. All right, uh, hopefully listening to Asta has volume. Is that... Can I hold questions till the end? Because I want to make sure we get through all of it. Um, can I hit questions at the end, please? Um, all right. Um, hopefully, listening to Asta has got you really excited and interested in this and thinking that if this is a place uh, that we can get to, that it's a place worth getting to. Oops, start my timer here. And, uh, but that just kind of takes us back to the top of the hour of like, is this going to work? And when we talk to people who sort of have some of these objections and concerns, like they're interested, but they um, sort of phrase some of those concerns in, I would love to try it, but, but, how do you answer some of the, the real challenging questions about this? I want to try this, but I'm worried that people will go do crazy things that my security team is going to be on the hook for. Okay, I'm worried that if people don't have to come to me and gate through me to get their stuff deployed, how am I going to know what's out there? We're worried that if we no longer have that stick that says we're from security, you have to fix this, are people going to fix vulns? And then finally, like Asta was alluding to, maybe the deal breaker. If teams don't come to us, if we now have to go to them and spend time being warm and fuzzy and convincing, how do we scale up for that? Can we get enough people to do that effectively? So I kind of want to walk you guys through those. Let's start with these crazy things. Are people going to do crazy things? Are they going to go out and use languages and tools and frameworks and technologies that we haven't vetted 
that we as security people probably haven't even heard of. And the truth is, if we get out of their way, if we stop gating them and saying no, then absolutely, they're going to do that. But those teams also have domain knowledge that we don't have in security. They have expertise. They know about tools that will make them more effective. So we really want them to do that. That's actually pretty powerful. That is um, a great strategic advantage if we can allow it. So um, it's more of a question of can we make that potential additional risk reasonable so we're not surprised, so we can actually lean into this. Oops, there we go. <laughs> Correct slides. Um, let me put a, put a specific point on that. This is um, a slide from a talk given by a leader in um, Netflix's Developer Tools Org. And you can see um, a lot of the, the languages that we use here at Netflix. Uh, obviously, the big core general purpose languages that you would expect. But scattered in and amongst there is an incredibly long tail of domain-specific tools, really powerful stuff that we at security don't necessarily know about. And a team's ability to make those choices makes them more effective and makes us as a company more effective. So this to us is a little bit scary, but it's a huge win and we, would, and we really want to lean into enabling that. So how do we do that? One thing that Asta alluded to a little bit, let me deep dive into a second, is this, paved, this idea of a paved road. The other one is for those teams who are doing some of this interesting stuff, some of the, um, the obscure type things, if they are sort of off or beyond the paved road, all of our core security capabilities, stuff like TLS, logging, um, auth n, auth z, um, deployments, that kind of stuff, um, all of those are exposed through like simple first class APIs developed by people with real programming skills, like not someone like me. And they're maintained like that. So teams can, can do a small amount of incremental effort to sort of bring themselves back into the warm embrace of all of those security technologies that we take for granted. And that, hey, if you, you know, call this JSON API and do a little bit of stuff, then you have all these cool security capabilities. That's a much more reasonable ask than don't do this or reinvent something. So let's talk about that paved path. Um, sorry, paved road. I'm going to keep saying paved path, but I should say paved road before Asta hits me. Um, uh, and who here has assessed like a Ruby on Rails app? As many as I expect. Okay. So uh, the, the analogy here is to that. If you've sort of assessed one Rails app or two Rails apps, you pretty much realize that they are so convention driven and so standardized and so normalized um, that if, once you've seen one, you've seen them all. And that goes even further. Like, they're really good to automate against. You can do commands like rake routes and see all of the endpoints. And that kind of standardization and convention also means that they're really amenable to automation. So like the Brakeman scanner is really awesome and really powerful. And um, uh, that, uh, that kind of thing of if you can automate um, is uh, it's really nice and powerful. Um, so what we're, think what we're talking with this paved, paved road is that idea but for sort of entire classes of apps across a whole bunch of languages for our developers. From Git in it all the way to their entire deployment lifecycle is can we automate, can we standardize, can we templatize so that we understand a tremendous amount about an app even if we've never seen it before. So going back to those teams who are doing potentially crazy stuff is if they are on the paved road as far as it will get them, when they first step off of that paved road, they've got all of those strong, maintainable, supportable choices behind them. Let's add to that. Who's sort of Spinnaker? Sorry. CI, CD pipeline. We're super excited about this. We use it all the time. It's incredibly powerful. Um, that is the deployment story for Teams. That's how they get their code um, uh, sort of from repository built running out there. And, um, oops, there we go. Um, so this means that apps are deployed in a sane and consistent way. They're traceable back to the artifacts that were built for them. What are the builds? Who are the people? What was the check-in? All the way down there. Um, sort of sane, reasonable security groups. And then also this immutable infrastructure. All new artifacts every time. So every time we're building an app, um, we're not changing the existing ones. We're putting out an entirely new stack, which gives us a chance to make sure that it's on the latest uh, dependencies, on the latest operating system, those kinds of things, so stuff doesn't get stale and crusty and janky out there. 
which is incredibly powerful for us as security people, reduces the things that we might potentially have to worry about. When we put these two together, we get this. Looks like, kind of on the left-hand side, somebody said, it looks like you threw up security tools all over the right-hand side here. And yeah, kind of did. I think it's beautiful. The, the implication why this slide is set up this way is that these things on the left are what make this on the right possible. So these tools that are not about security, they're about developer productivity, they're about speed, they're about developer velocity, that gives us the hooks and the sources of, and the, uh, sources of truth to automate and do all of the security stuff. I can't talk about all of these tools here. You've probably seen some other uh, talks that we've given come up to me afterwards if you're interested. But the point is that these couldn't exist without all that other stuff that wasn't necessarily built with security in mind. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of geeking out about like operational and, and like developer productivity tools, like let me stay in my lane here. We're AppSec people, we care about these AppSec interactions. So here's a typical AppSec interaction is assess this thing. Are there risks, are there vulns, find them. And look at all the choices that you would have to, to sort of scrutinize and discuss and think about how long it would take to sort of architecture review and code review and pen test all of this if we just came to a team. But if we can rely on all of this paved path, automate, standardize, templatize, stuff that developers are using because it makes them more effective, not necessarily for security, then that discussion looks like this. And I relax just looking at that. Like, this is way nicer. Assess just that thing, have conversations about, hey, what's new with your app? What's that one little crazy thing that you're doing on top of a really solid, understandable, comprehensible foundation? And they can fiddle with any of these other things. Again, guardrails, not gates. But then our question becomes, hey, what'd you change from the paved road? And that's way more tractable. A team's gonna sit still for that and feel a heck of a lot better about that conversation. All right. Let's go on to this next one. Um, if teams don't have to come to us and gate through us to get their stuff deployed, how the heck do we know what's out there? And usually I get that objection in the context of like a real sort of heavy survey or like spreadsheet driven process. Like answer all of these questions and then security stamps it and now you can go deploy. So let me ask a question in return. Does a process like that really work as well as we'd like it to? Teams are gonna fill out the surveys if they have to, but they certainly don't know all the answers that we want them to know, and they're not gonna phrase it in the way that we wanted them to phrase it. It's a point in time, because nobody's ever gonna come back and fill out that survey a second time once you've let them deploy. Um, and it's often the answer is just gonna be blank, like bare minimum best effort. So if we're building a system based on this gating approach, then what we're ending up with is something that's inaccurate, incomplete, out of date, doesn't scale, and in the end, it annoys our constituency. So it's not a great model for doing something that's really important, which is creating that application inventory. So if asking people isn't going to work, where can we get that information? This is Spinnaker. This is the, the, our CI CD that I was just sort of drooling over a little while. And, and there's a reason that I'm super excited about it. Because from an AppSec engineer's perspective, there's like all of the information that we'd want to know to build our application inventory. What AWS account are we in? What is the canonical name for this application? How many of them are running out there? Um, what security groups does it have? What uh, databases does it need to talk to? What apps does it need to talk to? Um, how do we get logs for it? Um, all of these kinds of things are available right here through this, by hooking into the CI CD, and of course they're gonna be accurate because this represents how things are actually deployed. And it's up to date, and as something like Spinnaker or our other tools get smarter about apps, then, the, then our uh, sort of security-based uh, application security inventory just sort of gets better alongside that without ever having to bug anybody for that. So this sort of deployed in Spinnaker, like hook into the actual source of truth there instead of bugging people, um, that's really what we base it on. There's another asterisk, you're probably getting used to this, is that there's always gonna be some little edge cases. Um, but by and large, this gets us far enough uh, there that, uh, that it's powerful and it's really the right thing to do. So a theme that you might be seeing here is this idea of hitching the security wagon to developer productivity. 
everybody wants developer productivity to succeed. That's like a no-brainer investment for a company is make your developers faster and more effective. If security can come up, like hook ourselves onto that and come along for the ride, then we're going to be effective in a way that doesn't aggravate people. Let's take this next one. If we're out there generating a lot of vulns, um, are people going to fix them if we give up that stick that says, hey, we're from security, you must fix this? And I would argue that if your company culture is reasonable, it doesn't have to be perfect, if your company culture is reasonable, then yes, people are going to fix vulns. But they're only going to fix the ones that matter. And the truth is, not every vuln is important. Not every cross-site scripting is important. And this incredibly helps with the idea of security nihilism or security absolutism. Have you heard, anybody heard this term, security nihilism? If you're not familiar with the term, security nihilism, absolutism, um, go look it up. There's an incredible amount of really good writing done on it, and it's basically that idea of um, that nothing's ever good enough for the security team, sort of alluded to that Phoenix Project slide. You know, our shrill voices, no, that fix isn't good enough, that fix isn't good enough. You, always, you often hear it with, like, well, a hacker could still. A hacker could still. Like, no, no fix is perfect. Um, this helps with it because um, we are there helping and discussing rather than saying, uh, rather than getting any ability to give an edict. So how does how does this uh, like how do we create this at Netflix? Asta talked about it before. Teams own every aspect of their code. It's sort of very DevOpsy um, in that um, they own their their code, their requirements, the deployment, all of the illities, all that kind of stuff. There's lots of centralized teams to help them, but teams understand that they own their code. That puts us more into a consulting model. We are going to bring uh, into a, like a collaborative teaching helping model. We're going to bring them something. We're going to help them put it in context. We're going to help them understand it. And we're going to be OK with whatever decision they make. So that sort of focus on providing context, that puts us in a way better position. And we can do things like you know, a threat model with a team and do those kinds of things, and then come back six months later and say, hey, um, here's a vuln. You told us this. I, we think it should be important to you based on that. Um, what's the call? Any other questions? And if we feel like we've been heard and we've listened to them, we do as much listening in these meetings uh, as anything else, um, then whatever decision they make, we can be at peace with. Like, it's a little bit weird as security people to not fix vulns sometimes, but if we know that the right choice is being made sort of from that risk perspective, then we can find a little bit of zen there. And also, if we sort of look at that soft instead of hard power, over time, teams will look to their left and look to their right and see what's the security bar in their peers. And, they can, and people know, and, and nobody wants to be behind. So that security bar will sort of come up over time in sort of an informal security peer pressure if you let it. You can't force that. And finally, this frees us up to think about killing classes of bugs. Um, if we're not tracking down every single cross-site scripting or something like that, um, a team can come to us and say, man, we're tired of this whack-a-mole work can you help us do something more significant? And then they're willing to invest that engineering effort as just plain old engineering effort. Again, not special. We're not asking for little one-offs that, that prioritize things. All right, finally to this last one. Especially if you're an AppSec leader or manager, this one you know, may seem like the deal breaker. If we have to go out to teams and do all this warm fuzzy and things like that, um, how do we, like, how do we have enough people for this? Um, this sort of comes from maybe in the back of, of our mind, we still have this idea that at some point in the end, we have to line up every single app that we have and like pen test our way through them. Um, and like this, this idea that I want to keep harping on is like no matter how many like CSRF or cross site scripting and things like that you pile up, those don't necessarily lead to big strategic risk reduction. So we're looking for those high leverage things, those things that are actually worth doing over the long term. And at Netflix, we like to really clarify our ideas by saying what we're doing and what we're not doing. So I want to be explicit here. This is when the AppSec team is doing its quarterly planning. This is what it looks like, sort of putting those big rocks in and then the sand later. Our big rocks are these things that we think make big differences over a long period of time, that if we invest in them, they will continue to pay out. So platform, 
Obviously, we talked about that. That kind of paved path. Um, how can we automate, standardize, templatize, make teams more effective, and then add security into that? Automation, automating against that standardization in Spinnaker and uh, CI, CD, that kind of stuff, to get um, both find vulns and to get visibility of things. And then strategic partnerships. This is going out and working with teams, getting a lot of that context over the long term, saying, where do you want to be? What concerns you? How can we drive you there over multiple quarters? Not weeks, years. And then everything else just has to fit in there. With the implication here, and we want to make it explicit, that it's OK to triage. Like, there are apps and teams that will be OK if we don't get to them this quarter. Like, once you get past that fire drill mentality and think about investing, we felt like we became more effective. Let's get even more explicit. Again, what are we doing? What are we not doing? I really like this. Um, there is all the things that an AppSec team could do up here. But where we try and live is right here on the right. These themes that we've been talking about, all those high leverage activities. But what's particularly cool to me about this is that left to right, this is actually sort of the journey that our AppSec team has come on. Um, oh, like over the last four or five years, you know, we started far more over there with those kinds of practices. And if you look at that, that's like if you took a little AppSec consultancy and dropped it into a large company, that's probably the sort of stuff that you would do, sort of pen testing, threat modeling, code reviews for anybody who asked, just kind of try and do that kind of thing, try and pen test your way through the entire thing. And as we realized like, what was effective and what was actually reducing risk, we were able to move more and more over here. And this is where we're at now. And we feel pretty good about this. But that also sort of implies the truth that this hasn't been always true and probably won't be. There's probably more stuff to the right here that we will sort of learn and refine and get better at over time. So this is absolutely a journey. It's a technical journey as well. A lot of those, that cool tool slide that I showed you, those were not Rev0 or Rev1 of those tools. They had many that came before them. And although a lot of this stuff, uh, these, these are tools that we've talked about, that we've written about, that we're very excited about, but uh, we have gone beyond those tools and, and each revision helped us get to the next one, helped us become a little bit more effective, understand the problem space. So if you yourself are in that place where you're starting this early automation efforts and you're doing a few things here and there, um, then don't feel bad about that if they're not giving you everything you want. It is a journey, and like embrace those V0, V1. All right, let's take us down to the home stretch. Takeaways, hopefully you're seeing the themes come out. We wanted to make the case that this security without blocking can be just as effective and probably more so than anything else. We hope we've made that case well. This idea of hitching the security wagon to developer productivity, of getting in with the tools that people really want to succeed and finding ways to leverage those is incredibly powerful. One of the places to hitch that wagon that's super exciting is CI and CD, which implies that you really should care a heck of a lot about a powerful CI CD story. That lets us get automated visibility and action. If we want to like, iterate over all of our apps or all of these endpoints or feel confident that we're seeing new apps as they enter our ecosystem, this is the place to do it. And that's a really powerful place for an AppSec team to, AppSec team to be. And then finally, this partnering for strategic wins. Um, we think this is how we drive systemic risk reduction, and we're really doubling down on these long-term partnerships with the bigger engineering efforts and asks um, at the expense of some of that smaller stuff, but we think this is the right thing to do. So clearly, we're excited about this. We care about it. We think it's the right way to go. Um, we hope we've communicated that to you, and we would love to hear your questions. Um, uh, yes, we've got a mic that's going to be passed around, and I think I know what the first question is going to be. And I'm so sorry yeah. for, for, for oh, no. cutting you off there. I just want to make sure we got through to the end. I was, I was a little overzealous. No worries. Um, uh, let me sync up with you afterwards. I don't know if that's a number that we have out there, and I wouldn't want to misspeak. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, then my second question is, when you talk about the strategic partnerships, could you explain that a little bit, like what you mean by that, like what you guys do there and, and what that is? So a lot of that, what ends up happening is, you know, as we are collecting all this inventory information and running all of this like automated 
uh, stuff, what we do is kind of find those high risk areas, meaning, you know, stuff like platform engineering or, you know, where if we, you know, made an improvement in this area, that would be a multiplier in terms of risk reduction and identifying those areas based on the kind of data and app uh, or a product within the company has or uh, you know the kind of interactions they're having are the external facing or not so usually what that partnership looks like is like we'll start with sort of like a discovery sort of thing to understand like all of their attack surface we'll do you know like a threat modeling exercise figure out uh, you know if we need to do any sort of code analysis we would do that and really just like work with the team to come up with a security roadmap of you know, here are the ten most important things you can do to improve your security posture. And they're not necessarily at the vuln level. It's often about like features of hey, you guys have got all sorts of data. Um, we would really like to get to a point where you have auth n on everything in this environment, even though it's an isolated environment. And we talk about that for a while. And we talk about blast radius. We talk about pivoting. And we talk about attacker behavior. And we say you know like, are you comfortable with what that risk story looks like? And if they say for now yes, then we prioritize different stuff. And if they say okay. We think we can get that done, but we're going to need to build some stuff. That's kind of the, the more strategic partnership aspect. So there's a lot of that. C come hit us up afterwards, and we can get into it. But um, it ends up being a lot of like writing almost like policy papers for somebody saying, this is where you could get to you know, with these sorts of efforts. Sweet. Uh, can we put it back on the um, prioritization grouping slide Absolutely. thing? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, so we had, what, three talks and a panel on threat modeling mm -hmm. uh, during this particular conference. Mm -hmm. um, per app threat modeling is marked as de-emphasized, which, I mean, I understand. Um, how did you guys get to that point? Yeah. But, but uh, go ahead, fin finish the question. But I'm already seeing where you're. Where yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quizzing like why. I'm quizzing how. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, th this is. I'm saying way too close to the mic. Um, the per app threat modeling is there specifically, like caveated because we we really care about threat modeling. Except we do it. We can't possibly do it in every single app. So often it's more yeah. of that organizational strategic partnership stuff. If we get an organization, the people in there, what's the law about like systems are sort of defined by by the, the the people that put them together. So we'll get enough of those people together and apps sort of form constellations of things that they're gonna talk to based on functionality. We have a very microservices architecture. So like doing it an app at a time, um, we tend to just draw a bigger line around a lot of apps, say how do these things talk and threat model at that level, right. more of the org level. So uh, probably should have put threat modeling like explicitly on here, although it's really kind of part of the partnership stuff that we do. Yeah, I mean, it was like I kind of mm -hmm. implicitly gathered mm -hmm. it, it became more org level with maybe like per app happening on like a case by case basis where mm -hmm. necessary. Yeah. But yeah, that, that was like the missing gap that I wanted to figure out because there was a massive emphasis here. And yes. it was a little and bit. And I lost. sat in on every single one of those. So yeah. thank you for giving us the opportunity to clarify. Yeah. So I have one question. Um, so since you have such ty open type environment, right? Do you find scenarios uh, where the developers actually don't reach out to you when there's something which actually requires a lot of security attention, and then you find out in the end before a release or something like that uh, that this happened? <laughs> uh, it, it's going to happen. Like there is no magic bullet for that in any org. Um, this has allowed us to drive that down. We think for some of the reasons that Asta was talking about, um, which is if people know that we're not gonna say no, then they're more likely to come to us, and if people have had really good experiences with security in the past, then somebody's gonna go, eh, that seems like security might have something to say about it. You know, why, why don't you go and pop on up there to, to, to their desk? Our bullpen is like in with all the rest of the developers. Um, and then they just drop by, and, and we can have those conversations, and it's like, we can give a little bit of advice, we can give a little guidance, you know, pat on the back, demonstrate an exploit, whatever is the right thing to make sure that people have that context. So it's going to happen, but we think it happens less in this model. Sorry, do you want to hit that as well? Yeah, the only thing I want to add is like the, the thing to note here is that this is not perfect. 
this is what works for us. And we think that from like an overall risk standpoint, this is the direction we want to go in. So yes, that will definitely continue to happen. But we want to rely on the fact that we have built that trust with the team that they would want to collaborate with us. And let me actually add one more piece to that because it was the nice asterisk that she had up there of like, Context, not control, star. And you're like, really? Come on. Um, but that's when we get into stuff like PII, PCI, where like there's, there's real requirements and the margin for error is much smaller. And those are places where those teams sort of have the practice and the drill and a very open communication. Like, you know, there's, there, there isn't going to be a way that we just like don't hear from those teams for a while. Um, so, yeah, that's the star there um, because, yeah, there's some places that you've got to be that much more. Go get them. Uh, I, I can sort of estimate it for you, and actually, um, uh, you can go look back at uh, other public AppSec talks that uh, Netflix has given and see some of that. So I think we presented at one of the, f I, we, I think Scott Barron's, uh, and was it Andy, Andy presented yeah. there? Um, uh, like, f at the one of the first AppSec Cali's on kind of where they were at there, and it was very much like automation and some of those tools, um, like Scumbler 1.0 and Monterey that they were like really excited about at the time. Um, and that was just coming off of like we're just like doing consultancy stuff. So like four, five plus years of kind of a slow journey there. So it's a process. I, I just wanted to repeat the question. It was oh, about uh, it was about how long it took us to get from the left to the right here. Hey, um, so you had a piece talking about automating finding vulnerabilities, and you said about thirty percent or 36% of vulnerabilities uh, were automatically found. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if that sort of includes false positives and things like that, and how you go about filtering them out. Because like some of the tools you said you were using are like Arachne and things like that, mm -hmm. which are just going to have false mm -hmm. positives in them. So the 36% is actual ticketed vulnerabilities, not false positives. Mm -hmm. So that's after going mm -hmm. through the noise. And then the triaging of things that we're finding, it, we kind of roll that into our on-call. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, false positives and using automated tooling is like a super challenge. I actually accidentally skipped a slide on like things that we don't have um, answers to, and so yes, um, it's uh, it's a challenge for using a lot of tools. I give a shout out to Breakman because, as an example, that's like one of the tools that is, I know he's, <laughs> he's he looks up um, uh, because yeah, it's one of the tools that has not many false positives, and we were able to operationalize it pretty well. I saw on one of your slides you <clears throat> you're de-emphasizing um, like static analysis scans. So sort of, I think that was in the sort of used with used with reservation. Okay, like so definitely use it. We we think the technology is is like powerful and important, but we fight the false positive. Sorry, the, the question. Oh yeah, you get the mic for the question. Okay, no, um, no that makes that mm, makes sense to me. Um, we have we have one and it's very conservative and so there's a lot of mm -hmm. dupes and. We don't let anybody. Mm -hmm. We try not to let developers mm -hmm. see it until we've cleaned it out, and it's mm -hmm. you know it'll go from like a thousand things to oh these two that are yeah maybe. we we don't we don't have a silver bullet yet either, so that's why it's in there. Yeah, but. one of the things that we've been kind of thinking about, and anyone who has great ideas for this, come talk to us. Is you know a lot of the tooling that we're running is kind of like the sort of stuff that comes to us first, and we have to triage and get through the false positives. If you have ideas of things that could be like, you can send this to the developer directly, like, and you're doing that successfully at your organization, please come talk to us. <laughs> could you also give one example of uh, self-service that was in your last column? Is that uh, yeah, so we're actually working, uh, we just piloted this tool called Security Brain, and what it does is uh, it's actually self-service in the sense of you know all this information that we are collecting about your apps that are out there. We'll you know we'll look at things like oh, okay here are the one tickets that are open against uh, this particular app, or here are you know the best practices that you're not following in this app, and you know so basically giving you that high-level security view of each of your applications that you're responsible for. Uh, this is an internal tool that we are piloting right now. It's called Security Brain. Is there a potential timeline on release? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, the, the, the timeline is, we'll see. <laughs> there are some commercial products that do something similar to that, and I wouldn't mind having what you guys do. If this it's, is why if we it, If it's useful, we'll, we'll see. Do, we'll, we'll know. What's the breakdown between vendor tools versus in house? I'm not going to take a guess at that because that would imply that I like I know about all of the tools. Um, oh, if you want, um, it, it, uh, sure. 
it's uh, we do a ton in house. Um, actually, the people sitting immediately in the row in front of you build like so much <laughs> of our stuff. So chat with them afterwards. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that's probably a good chance for me to say like we didn't we. We didn't write all of the tools and stuff that were up there. There's like all sorts of people across the company who build tooling that we rely on to get our jobs done. So it's not like you know, it's not not the AppSec show here. But um, uh, m much in-house development, selected external vendors who work well with the way that we want to work. Real quick question. So, <clears throat> so real quick, um, when you guys are vetting some of the automated findings, you know, th there's two categories. There's code hygiene and then there's legit vulnerability. How do the developers deal with that over time? Do they start to get upset with you guys and we're like, okay, this is SQL injection, but it's more or less code hygiene. It's not actionable versus this is the legit threat. Like, how do you guys branch those two? How do you guys deal with it? Our approach so far has been we're not going to submit something to to, we're not going to send something to a team. We're not going to ticket it. We're not going to raise it with them unless we feel pretty strongly that it's one that we're going to advocate for them to fix. Um, rarely, um, basically that. So yeah. So co like code quality, code hygiene stuff doesn't really make that bar. Um, and again, it's that idea of prioritization. Of I'm not going to show up with like 15 things that I want them to fix. Like that conversation is not going to go well. I'm going to show up with the ones that I feel like. Based on like you know an unauthenticated attacker or somebody who has this network position that is plausible to get, and here's the story and the threat model that you guys have talked about and the stuff that I know you have on your plate, I would really like it if maybe you could get this one done in a quarter or this one done in 90 days. Or occasionally we're kind of going to come in and be like, it's got to be today, man. Um, so, but you know that's that's the balance is that we really want to be parsimonious with what we're bringing to them. So just to play back what you just mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey, this could be SQL injection if mm -hmm. you know, your scanner. Yeah. We're pretty much I almost like the, the the mental thing is like if their response is gonna be, hey, we're really busy, and I'm gonna be like, okay, cool. Like that one's never gonna come to them. It's like they're really busy, and I'm like, can we find some time? Like that those are the those, that's the the minimum bar that we're gonna bring to them. Okay, thanks. <coughs> I had a question regarding uh, your reservations. Uh, I was wondering why you had reservations with third-party pen testing. Is it about uh, manual pen testing in general, mm -hmm. or you just didn't have any good results with, you know, dealing with third parties? I think the thing there is, you know, we're we're very mindful with that in terms of, you know, making sure that we're making a risk-based decision on what apps we're pen testing, like. Again, at the end of the day, third-party pen testing services are not cheap. So even if it's not, we're not spending security engineer time to do that, we still want to make sure that we're pen testing the right things. Kind of going back to the point that Patrick made, where what we're not trying to do is line up all your apps and like pen test your way to security. All right. So um, another question from that same block on the priority grouping. Um, the uh, so. Training was there, um, and I gathered from Patrick's point earlier, like definitely use them, but there are certain things to keep in mind. And from what I can understand, Netflix has a whole bunch, like you guys, Netflix, et cetera, have a whole bunch of things in place to steer developers, the guardrails, without needing to rely on training to accomplish that. So then my question becomes, what other reservations may exist with, say, running any sort of training program or whatever trainings you guys might be doing at Netflix, like how do you compensate for those two? We're not, uh, this, is, this is actually a totally rich place for discussion and there's differing opinions within the company for sure of like how much we should do. Um, uh, I, I don't think that we're gonna train developers to become security professionals and, and we don't wanna try to do that. So that just has the question of like, how far down that road do we want to go? How much time do we want them to invest in it? Um, you know, they are, all the developers are really good at what they do. And, and we can't like take up all their headspace doing security stuff. So um, it's a lot more about like um, sort of context and putting things on their radar and um, letting them know like, here are the tools that are available. Here's examples of how to use those. Here is something that illustrates kind of what your threat model is um, and, and here's when to reach out or here's what the resources available are rather than like get them to a point where they know how to contextually encode in all of the like proper output encoding places. Like that's a thing that 
you, I don't think you're going to be effective if you try and train people to get that answer right. So we sort of stop at know when you're in deeper waters, know when to reach out. So that kind of gives me... You had a thought, sorry. Yeah, it's almost like teaching them security judgment, and that's where we go yeah. to. I like yeah. the security <laughs> judgment. So let me, let me build on that. Um, so you've got... I am so sorry. I know you have a question on your mind, too. Um, so um, you've got the... Um, uh, You've got developers who are okay. Let's let's. They're triaging a finding. Like they're they're working on something. They're they're hardening their code, um, and you're exposing them to a whole bunch of resources. So then my next question becomes: Are you guys also running analytics on how often they actually access these resources to see whether or not what's being exposed to them is being used, and therefore the awareness is like there? I've got a bug filed against myself to put analytics into <laughs> some of those tools. I haven't gotten to it yet. It's a great idea, and it's probably something that. Um, we could do do more of. See, because now, now the way I, my closing point, I'm so sorry, um, is that sounds like a great way to get the training out there to the people that actually need it um, and then track through the analytics like who's absorbing that content. And if you're seeing people are being exposed to it and are not absorbing that content and they're still producing adversely, mm -hmm. then maybe something more targeted can be used. That's just my two cents. Cool. Thank you. So when you're building in such a microservice polyglot environment, um, it's nice to talk about like being attached to the to the developer tools that they're already using and stuff like that. But when you're actually trying to fix something like uh, a class of vulnerabilities or or authenticity everywhere, uh, what what is your approach for building those tools? Do you guys, does the security team, build it? across the board, so like you go to all your microservices and we're, you know, we're gonna attach to all your frameworks, or do you like come up with a proof of concept and then partner up with the individual teams to fix it? Yeah. How do you make that happen? So uh, some of that other, like it's not the AppSec show, um, is uh, we have a sister team uh, that is uh, platform security, uh, and they really are full-time development on some of those like common right answers. So when we're talking about you know standardized uh, auth n, standardized auth z, like, uh, right answers for crypto and secret management, and all that kind of stuff. They are um, really doing all that development full time. So we like sit right next to them, work pretty closely with them. Um, but uh, we, so that le that frees us up to spend a lot of our time on. Hey, do you know that these tools exist? Are you using them correctly? Are they not necessarily meeting your needs? Um, you know, can we take some of that information back? So um, yeah, there are like there's a, a really good team of people who spend their time building that. Um, and that's um, could could easily be part of the AppSec team, but I think because it's such an important core function, um, we've uh, uh, that's a different team. All right, we'll be outside in the hallway if anyone has any other questions, because uh, we're at time. Uh, thank you so much. You guys are a great audience.